Amen. The title of my sermon tonight is Misappropriated Emotions. Somebody say misappropriated emotions. When receiving the news as a faculty at URCA that Elder Scott Hunter had passed, there was a certain silence of heavy heartedness that day. And given the type of man that he was, this type of silence was appropriate. Had someone had received this news and began to tell a witty joke, laugh uncontrollably, or get the case of the excessive talking bug, they would not have been received with a kind look. And if they had gotten body slammed, I do not think anyone would have tried to hinder it because their response would have been misappropriated during our time of loss. When you misappropriate something, you put it in the wrong use. You apply it wrongfully. And this applies full circle with many of marriages, relationships with children, relationships amongst the saints of the most high God have been severed due to the absence of sincerity and the absence of a listening ear when the person on the other end wanted a voice of reason or needed a helping hand or just needed someone to share with their results on their day. Now not knowing how to be what you need to be for someone when you need to be it is detrimental to your influence, detrimental to your upward mobility and detrimental to your character, but not knowing how to gain an interest in a sense of urgency when Christ requires it can be detrimental to your soul. The lack of interest in the sense of urgency that few, that was the few that displeased God enough to have the prophet Amos to write woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Instead of being grieved at the afflictions of God's people, the kingdoms of Judah and Israel, which was mentioned as Joseph and reference in verse 6, these rulers at that time period were relaxed and at comfort in the the strengths of their cities and in the comforts of Zion and Samaria. I thank God for where I live. I thank God for the good wife that he gave me. I thank God for the wonderful children that I have. I thank God for the great family that supports me. But I can't get so fully enthroned in these things that I lose sight of the serious times that we're in. Even while my father-in-law was lying on his hospital bed and he's still there, I was glad to have a wife that understood that God's word must be preached. But I was even more glad, Pastor Wooden, that this nobody had to fire me up and say man come out here and preach this message but it was deep down in my soul and from time to time we all face situations where the present where the option is presented for us to lose sight of the fight become comfortable or even respond foolishly and not have a sense of urgency during these times when we're faced with the option to end the task early close up shop and lose our fire we need to find solace in a person that we can identify with all of these options during the time in his need when he was needed for most comfort. When he faced death, his disciples behaved misappropriately. They fell asleep. But I find admiration in Jesus Christ that when he found his disciples asleep, he did not say, Lord, I fed the hungry. Lord, I healed the sick. Lord, the lame now walk. And God, the dumb now talk. But he went down on his knees and he began to pray again. And then he went back and the disciples were fast asleep again. And then he went back and prayed again. And then he came back another time and found the disciples sleep. And he prayed a third time. We must approach prayer in this manner. We must pray until we convince that we can fight another fight. We must pray until we're convinced that the world is all at ease. Sometimes when I pull up in my car and I walk through the driveway, my wife knows not to come by me and I look up to the sky and I say Lord I need you to help me God I'm limited I don't have strength but you are mighty Lord I need your comfort this may not be a good season right now and I need your powerful hand and then I try to close the prayer and pastor wouldn't death will creep up on me and say that person's gonna die and I'll go back to the to the driveway and I say Lord come help me give me my fire back Lord, revive me again. Lord, give me the fight back. Lord, give me my joy back. How many of you ever been there that you had to go cry again? Cry out unto the Lord. And then sometimes the words escape me. And I just say, Lord, Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord, Lord. Help, help, help. Save, save, save. Deliver, deliver, deliver. As a matter of time, it's a fine time for you to lift up those holy hands and begin to cry out unto God. Say, God, help me. God, deliver my soul. God, 
do something for me. Come on, lift him up. Lift him up, Zion. Yet he speaks throughout eternity. He said, if I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men, all men unto thee. Come on and put your hands together. I've got a word for the preachers in the house. I'm coming from this topic. Preach, preach, preach. When Amos prophesied to the northern kingdom, Israel had been divided for 150 years. It was a time of economic prosperity, pride and arrogance, religious hypocrisy and moral decay. Israel had become at ease, you've heard it already, complacent and reckless, and they had no appetite for God. The more Israel had, the more complacent the people became. They did not believe judgment was coming, so they spared no expense in splendorous living and denied themselves nothing. It was the leaders of Samaria, the chiefs of the nation, who led the northern kingdom into sin. Governments have the ability to lead nations headlong into sin through declarations and decrees, proclamations and laws, pacts and treaties. There are obvious parallels between Israel and America. The more we have relied on our own strength in rebellion against God, the more reckless we have become. Consider this, just last year, July 2011, the Fourth Circuit United States Court of Appeals that rules on federal cases in the Carolinas, Virginia, and Maryland ruled in an ACLU backed lawsuit that the Forsyth County Board of Commissioners violated the Establishment Clause of the U.S. Constitution when they opened up their meeting in prayer. What does this mean? It means that it is now against the law in these states to invoke the name of Jesus in prayers during government meetings. Annually, since 2009, by presidential proclamation, the month of June has been declared National Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Pride Month. Now, what does that say to you? That means in the United States, what God destroyed nations for engaging in has achieved national respectability and validation. And let's talk about the Defense of Marriage Act, passed in 1996, has two parts to it. The first part says that no state has to honor another state's laws that recognize same-sex marriage because a state has a legitimate interest and encouraging the raising of children in homes with married mothers and fathers. The second part of the act defines marriage as only a legal union between one man and one woman as husband and wife. It defines spouse as referring only to a person of the opposite sex who is a husband or a wife. Well, as of March 2011, the federal government is no longer defending in court these definitions of marriage and spouse. Why? Because the government says the definitions are unconstitutional and they violate the equal protection laws of same-sex couples whose marriages are legally recognized under a state law. Now listen to this. On September 21, just a couple of weeks ago, Prominent members, so-called prominent members of the black clergy from around the country gathered in Maryland and they proclaimed their support of a referendum in that state to allow same-sex marriage. Several of these prominent black pastors were quoted as saying that African Americans do not own the patent on civil rights and morality. Like the cowardly 25, they say that same-sex marriage is about civil rights. We say the parameters of marriage have been defined 
since God created mankind. Therefore, marriage, far from being about civil rights, is about man's duty to obey the God of the Bible. To these apostate preachers, we say Christianity is a religion of exclusion. It is not a religion of inclusion. I want you to know, I see it every day, coming across my desk, that the time is coming and is now when the church will have to fight for its very right to exist. I see it. I see it every day. You need not be blind to it. What's behind all this corruption, this movement away from the things of God? Someone said it's religious decay and apostasy, empty religion, full of ritual, but not at all spiritual. Saints, this church's sin, sick soul is what we're looking at today. When Paul wrote his last will and testament in his second letter to Timothy, the church was facing a variety of threats from within and from without. Christians were suffering under Neronian persecution. In the province of Asia, people were defecting from the things of God in droves. And Paul was sitting in a Roman dungeon, facing certain death at the hands of an axe-wielding executioner. Bishop Henry Moore said of these times that Christianity trembled on the verge of annihilation. Paul knew that a time would come when men would not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust would keep to themselves teachers having itching ears, that they would turn away their ears from the truth and would be turned unto fables. So in the face of massive apostasy, Paul told Timothy to preach the word. He said the people won't hear it, but preach it anyway. Since today, Christianity trembles, not on the verge of annihilation, but on the verge of capitulation. Men and women, pastors and elders, bishops and missionaries are falling away from God. They deny the gospel of Jesus Christ, speaking evil things that are holy. They've supplanted Christian doctrine with their own doctrine and with the doctrine of devils. Preaching another gospel. William Sainston said preaching is in the shadows. The world doesn't believe in it. So we have apostate preachers who refuse to preach about hell and who fail to warn about damnation. These are men and women leading God's people into apostasy, fooling around with judgment stuff and don't even know it. But those of you who have been commissioned to preach, you better preach the whole word of God. Because for three transgressions and for four, we're not waiting on judgment. We are in the season of judgment. I'm telling you, I see it every day. Glory to God. God is sending judgment to this nation. And he's sending judgment to the individual. But he's also sending judgment to the church. Because judgment begins at the house of God. So preach. Those of you who preach, preach. Yes. Preach. Yes. Preach like there's no tomorrow. Preach come head of high water. Preach this word. Pastor, you don't need to be out there persecuted by yourself. Truth be told, all of us should be facing persecution. We should be preaching this word. So I say to you, preach, preach, preach.